grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I didn't see Superman this weekend. <laughs> no, I saw Star Trek, and there were about nine of us in the theater. It's amazing how that happens. You know, opening the box office a couple weeks ago, it's filled IMAX 3D. Now it's kind of a shoved in a little theater, and there's about nine of us in there watching Star Trek. Yeah. I don't know how many Trekkies we have, but interesting. Interesting stories, interesting storyline. I read something in the Huffington Post the other day, yesterday as a matter of fact, about Superman and Jesus, right? Can you draw parallels between Superman and Jesus? He was saying, well, you can in some respects and you can't in others. And they say, you know, Kal-El uh, um, is Superman's name. His father says, you need to go save the world. You're responsible. You can save the world. Does that sound familiar? You can save the world. Yes. Thank you. A little participation here. I want to hear an amen, too, while you're at it. Yes. <laughs> Get me going. So Superman saves the world, and it's a great thing if you just go and, and watch and, and watch what's going on. And this, this writer was saying, well, you got to a point. The, 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 um, the guy that, that likes excitement, likes thrills, walked out of there going, yes, Superman. He said, but the pastor of me said, oh, I'm not so sure because of the one thing that draws a parallel, not a draw a parallel, but draws a line in the sand between Jesus and Superman. It's, that's, that's the violence that happens. That's the redemptive violence. That you need violence to, to, to extinguish violence. And the, and the author was saying that is so unlike the Prince of Peace that Jesus was and portrayed. He could have if he wanted to. He could have used any means he wanted to to make his point, but he chose the way of peace and it wasn't a lot like Superman. Jesus died on the cross, humbled and betrayed and alone. And that's not who Superman is. Superman conquers and Superman. But don't get me wrong, I still will go see the movie. I still enjoy that kind of thing. But the theologian in me says, well, you know, you got to separate some stuff and, you know, take it for what it is. But in the story today, and you remember the last couple weeks, Jesus came upon a couple different situations. The centurions... A uh, slave was sick, healed him from a distance. Centurion's faith healed him. The next, last week, it was the, the, the woman who's lost her son, and the funeral procession was going out of town, and he touched uh, the funeral pall, and he stopped, and he said, rise and walk, and he, he raised this man from the dead. Nobody's faith was involved in that one, per se, that we know of. And this week, we have the woman who comes in, the, in an open door. It's not like today where you have, if you have a party, you kind of have closed doors and you only have certain, so many guests. This was open. Anybody could walk in and out of this dinner, of this situation. And just from this woman, being a woman, walks in and she sees this and she falls to her knees. And you have to think that she was probably with Jesus beforehand. The way the language is because Jesus says, you know, you're, you have, your sins have been forgiven and then in response, you come and do this for me. So her faith has made her well, in a sense, forgiven her sins. But those of us who, who, need to, who need to ask forgiveness, in which I tend to ask, need to ask more than to grant more forgiveness because of who I am. This, for us, is a, is a uh, paradox because on the one hand, we know that we need forgiveness. On the other hand, it's hard to ask. It's hard to reflect on ourselves to the need for asking for forgiveness. Jesus' main point was, well, you, Simon, didn't really, don't realize. You don't realize the need that you have, and thus you don't open up. You don't humble yourself enough to, to let me in, to forgive whatever sins you have. When I read the story, I sometimes identify with the woman, sometimes identify with Simon. I followed all the rules. I've done all the right things. I treat people well. Uh, there's not much for me to be forgiven for. And yet, on the other hand, when I really take a deep look at myself, the things I should have said that I didn't say, the things I said, the things I did, didn't do, whatever, the list gets pretty high of things I need to be forgiven for. And it brings me to my knees and causes a little depression, I'll be honest with you. And I think a lot of us have those kinds of thoughts of saying, well, we're okay. 
you got to get to a point where you're okay. But you have to realize that, like Simon, I can put myself up on a pedestal of self-righteousness. I don't delve into the, into the woman so much and ask for forgiveness for things. Sometimes I don't have the time to reflect. I don't give myself that time, the luxury of that. You remember a few years ago uh, in Pennsylvania where this boy was shooting these Amish kids at school. And you remember the funeral for these girls and for this boy, but this boy particularly, who walked over the hill to be part of this memorial funeral service at the graveside. But the Amish people, the parents of those slain girls, come to forgive, come to be with the family of the boy who caused this atrocity. Their sense of forgiveness is great. And we all look at the story and say, wow, if only I could do that. If only I could do that. My faith is not that great. But I need God to be part of me, to give me the strength to do what I need to do. To give hope to the world. To be part of a faithful community that will indeed look past the person and see the soul and see that all of us are in need of strength, of forgiveness, of grace, of all these things. In the stories previous to this, there was issues of faith. Is it the centurions? Is it whomever? Is it the woman's faith? Is it our faith that gives us healing, that gives us forgiveness? Is it is it something we do? Is it something that we, we cast our lots and see what happens? There's a rendering in the, in the Gospels, and you'll notice if you read the New Revised Standard Version, there's options in the bottom when you read the verses. In some of the verses, instead of saying the faith in Jesus, it says the faith of Jesus. You look at Romans 3.22 specific example. And you read that word in versus of and it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Faith in Jesus is our faith as something that we can do to receive. The faith of Jesus I think is more appropriate to what's going on in Luke's gospel here. It wasn't the centurion's faith so much. It wasn't the lack of faith at the, the funeral. It wasn't the woman's faith, but it was to our benefit, the faith of Jesus that makes these things happen. We don't have to depend so much on our faith, on our insecurities, our lack of strength, our courage, but we have the ability to trust that Jesus has the faith to give us forgiveness, to lighten the load, to make us like this woman who is just overjoyed because all of her sins have been forgiven by the one and the only one who can forgive sins, this Jesus Christ figure who walks around healing and telling stories and feeding people. That is our, our crux. That is our stability. That's our standard by which we live and grow and breathe. The faith of Jesus gives us new life, heals us from our infirmities, our illnesses, our hurts, our spiritual. The cross that represents Jesus helps us emotionally and spiritually and oftentimes physically too. We take the burden off of ourselves and we place it on Jesus' shoulders and he carries them for us, giving us life, giving us hope in this world. The faith of Jesus is what really matters. Faith that he will come through for us, that he is the son of God, and we are the forgiven ones. Amen.